Hello, hello little woman fans. I once came across this comment and it made me think a lot of things. Why Joe and Lori couldn't work things out. They fought, but so did Anne and Gilbert. A lot of people compare Anne and Gilbert to Joe and Lori. This is something that I've had to unlearn myself away from. I don't think people are necessary talking about Anne of Green Gables the book series but the Sullivan Entertainment Anne of Green Gables miniseries from 1985, where Jonathan Crombie played Gil and Megan Follows played Anne. Something that I have learned when making this podcast, that a lot of Joe and Lori fans use that series as their ideal couple comparison with Joe and Lori. What I found out was that Gilbert's proposal in that version is almost word by word copied from 1933 Little Woman, and then there is that scene where Diana sends Anne's story to the baking powder competition, and Anne wins, and she's horrified that the story got circulated to a publication that she pretty much looks down upon, and Gilbert gives her good, decent criticism, and then they fight, but it's very flirtatious, and apparently that is the way a lot of Joe and Laurie fans see Laurie and Joe. They fight, but they are flirty. In the Anne of Green Gables book, that scene doesn't actually happen, because it is Anne's neighbor, Mr. Harrison, who gives Anne the feedback, and there's nothing romantic in that scene. But here we see the power of television. When it comes to stalking, this is one of those things I sometimes wonder. Why is it such a common trope in Louisa May Alcott's books? I think I am getting closer finding the answer. I recently got myself a copy of Under the Lilacs, which is another children's book from Louisa May Alcott. I haven't read it, but but I started to look at the cover. It has two young blonde girls sitting in the garden, and they look sisters. I think they are eating berries or something. Then there is a boy in the bush, and when I picked up this book for the first time, I was like, Laurie, why are you there? <laughs> And the boy really looks like Laurie. He looks Italian with the curly brown hair. In Little Woman, there is a scene where the girls were in the garden. I think they were playing Bill Crim's process. And then Laurie sat in the bush for a while watching them. And then the girls spotted him and were like, hey, come here. I give him some leeway here because he's only 15. But when he's rejected by Joe, and he's 26 at that time, He's basically planning to stalk her until she says yes. And that is what Melody and I will be discussing today. Because it's like, when you are a kid, you don't always know what is proper behavior. But when you are an adult, you should have some understanding to respect others' privacy. There has been some discussion that should this be included in the adaptations? I think it should be. But only when the adaptation shows how... The relationship with Amy helps Laurie to become an adult. That is also what happens in the novel, because in the very end of the book, there is a moment where Laurie apologizes to Joe the way he behaved. And I think that is incredibly important. What I would like to know, was stalking considered romantic in the 19th century? We know that Louisa May Alt had a big crush on Waldo Emerson when she was a teenager, and she used to leave flowers on his doorsteps and sing underneath his window. And I guess she was hiding in the bushes. Emerson didn't know about her schoolgirl crush. But I wonder if Laurie is hiding in the bushes because that is what Louisa May Alcott used to do. Once again, you give her that leeway because she was a child. But I think we all know that as an adult, if you have unrequired feelings for somebody, stalking is the worst thing you can express them. In today's media, there are lots of examples how stalking is romanticized. I would highly recommend to check out Pop Culture Detectives channel on YouTube. He has a whole video essay about this trope and how it has been in entertainment. This is where the whole tension in Little Woman comes from. When the book came out, millions of little girls wrote to Louisa May Alcott, Please rewrite the ending. How could Joe be so cold to Laurie? When you are a child, you have a very idealized view about romantic love and what it is. When I was a kid, I used to love the movie Splash. You know, the mermaid film with Daryl Hannah and Tom Hanks. 
and I recently watched it again, I felt so uncomfortable watching some of the scenes. There's a moment when she's in the bathroom trying to hide her mermaid tail, and the Tom Hanks character is like shouting and banging the door, and mermaid is crying and panicking, and it is supposed to be romantic because he thinks she is in danger and he wants to protect her. But he's so angry, it feels really uncomfortable. And when they are ice skating, he proposes her and he gets really mean and angry when she says no. Of course, she is a mermaid, but he doesn't know that. I know it's an 80s fantasy film. I don't like the way he treats her. It's a really big contrast to the time when I was a kid and I thought it was a very romantic film. Think about the 2019 little woman. Joe and Laurie are best friends. Movie doesn't show any of these conflicts between them. When Joe says no to him, she's just like... I like my freedom too much. No other explanation is given. In the book she actually defends Friedrich because Laurie is badmouthing him. That's not in this movie. And in the book Laurie says that his money is going to solve everything. That's not in the film either. And when Laurie marries Amy, no explanation is given why he falls in love with her. And on top of that, Joe writes that letter wanting Laurie back which is not in the book. Should we be that surprised that there are millions of people who ship Joe and Laurie because of this movie, and people who think that Joe didn't care about Friedrich at all in this movie, because all these moments in the book where you can clearly see that Joe was very much into him there, the making out scenes, and this part where she defends him, they are not here. This is a quote from the other art blog. I read the whole original script for Little Woman 2019, and you are so right. It is so much better, so much more true to the book. What do you think happened here? This is what the other art blog answered. Hi, I know right. First, it seems like Greta never liked Bear. At least, that's what she kept repeating. He just didn't fit in her idea of Joe and Little Woman. But for the sake of adapting Little Woman, she had to put him into the script. I think there was some level of understanding of what Bear meant for Joe, though it's so weird. Actually, the final script is very contradictory, and we see it in the film. First, there is that lovely scene where Cho and Fritz dance and hug with lovely music and golden lighting, but then the filter turns blue and Bear becomes a villain. Not even in her movie did I understood what did he do wrong. Was he brutally honest? Yes, but wasn't Cho the one who says she liked strong words that mean something? Gerwig also had Oscar aspirations. She had already been close to be nominated for Lady Bird, and a lot of people felt she was snubbed. So how do you not let that happen again? You make noise. You take a deeply beloved popular story and transform it 21st century feminist agenda. You know many people don't like the ending, so they won't be angry for changing it. You spent the entire press tour talking about how only you understood Joe and Louisa May Alcott, how it is only... In your movie that Joe gets the ending Alcott wanted, how you free Joe from that horrible old ugly German man who only cut her wings. She even altered one of Joe's dream of opening a school for boys and made it a school for girls. Again, she did this to fit her feminist agenda. Cause it wouldn't be feminist to open a school for boys, right? Who cares if Joe never really had any girlfriends, made fun of girly manners, And even in the sequel, she keeps preferring boys over girls. Not to mention, she literally says she likes manly men. I swear I felt at some point she believed to be Louisa May Alcott reincarnated. Plus, you put some of those thoughts into Amy's character and get praised for making that character likable, even if you alter important facts about her and made her Laurie's toy. She could have made a noise by casting a brown-skinned actor for Laurie and addressing the immigration and racist issues in the Victorian era. She could have addressed more adult themes, but that risked box office numbers. Someone else pointed out this already, but Gerwig really spent most of the movie saying women don't need men. Yet in the last ten minutes the story becomes a conflict between two sisters over a man. And not even a great man, Laurie has no growth in this movie. Again, it is so contradictory. First, Joe insists she doesn't love Laurie in a romantic way, prompting people to say she's a lesbian or asexual slash aromantic, but then when she tears about the letter, the script says she's saying goodbye to her childhood love, 
What then? And let's not forget she cast Timothy Chalamet and Sowers Ronan, who people already ship. To be honest, most of these problems were already there in the first draft, but it was still better. You got to give it to her, it worked like magic. The movie did pretty well at the box office and people were furious that she didn't get nominated. They were shouting fuck you in the Golden Globes. Even Natalie Portman included her in her cape with all the female directors that went nominated. But she did not got one for the script. And because Academy knew people would get even angrier if she went home empty handed, they gave her costume design, not deserving. When you compare this movie with the rest of the nominees, it had absolutely no chance. It was the weakest movie. Additionally, she got the Barbie movie as a director. The praise from the cast was so over the top, even before realizing how bad this movie was, I thought it was way too much. Lady Bird is not that much of a revelation, and many thought it was just another white feminist story. Anyway, thanks Anon for this question. End quote. By the way, sorry that I have to blurry some words. It's because of the YouTube regulations. There was an earlier script to the Little Woman 2019 film. I think there were a couple different versions actually. At least the one that I read. It was a lot better than the final movie because it didn't have that ambiguous ending. And I read it before the film came, like a month before. And I think it was like a, a week before I saw the film. Somebody told me that Greta Gerwig had changed the ending and now she's on this full-blown anti Friedrich Bear mode. And that show wants Lori back in this film. In this earlier script, Friedrich was actually German and he and Joe had more scenes together. So how does one go from having a German Friedrich Bear in a script to making a movie with a French Friedrich and spending every single moment of the film tour making racist comments about his character, their nationality and their accent. What kind of an adult person does that? And it seemed to have happened very fast. Greta Gerwig has a very young audience base who idolize her, so she's really not giving a good example. And it is such a huge contrast to Louisa May Alcott who adored German culture and really embraced the German immigrants. It was also weird how Gerwig kept saying that I am Joe March in flesh or I am Louisa May Alcott. And then she goes on making fun of Joe's and Friedrich's relationship when she herself is in a relationship with a man who is 14 years older. It does give the impression that the film was only made for money and there wasn't any desire to respect the author or the original novel. This is Small Umbrella in the Rain, the Little Woman podcast, Stalking for Love. One of my German followers left a comment on Instagram that I can see why filmmakers want to romanticize Joe and Laurie, but are they attracted to stupidity? And it's not that Laurie is stupid, but he's not interested from the same things that Joe is interested. Like he's not, education. He's not intellectually curious. Friedrich has all of that. Which is mm-hmm. another hallmark of a good relationship is when you can teach each other things. You have enough things in common, Mm. but you have enough things that are different that you can share with each other. I read somewhere that the longest relationships that last are the ones where the couple share the same morals. Yeah. Like it's not sense of humor or it's not same interest. It's the same morals, the same values. That's, and I 100% agree with that because that's, So next Saturday, I will be celebrating my 17th wedding anniversary. Congratulations. (laughs) Thank you. And that's the thing is like me and my husband, we have very different interests, but we have the same value system and we're always sharing with each other the things that we, that we find interesting when they're, and they're different from each other. Like I do musical theater, but he doesn't really like musical theater, but he's a musician. So we respect each other in those aspects, right? And we can share our interests with each other, but we aren't, we don't share the same interests. 
you know, it's like tonight I I talked to him about this chapter. I was telling him some of the things <laughs> I found interesting about it. He has not read Little Women, but he's been around me enough that he's heard a lot about Little Women, <laughs> you know? And, and, but like, it's that respect thing too. Like he respects that I like to, to really delve intellectually into things. And so, I mean, yeah, I, that, I think that shared values and not necessarily shared interests are what is the most important thing. And I think it's funny is a lot of people, they try to, I think, base it too much on, oh, we both have to like sports or we mm. both have to like reading or we both have to like, you know, I don't think that's it at all. I think that, I think that the biggest thing is you have to respect each other and have the same moral standing. I agree. And I think in Little Woman, the best part that describes it is the symposium. Because when Friedrich speaks about religion, Mm -hmm. it goes so deep into Jo's heart, she wants to stand up and clap for him. Yes. And I love that scene. It's not in any adaptation. I don't know why. I know millions of Jo and Friedrich fans who say that it's their favorite chapter. Their favorite yeah. scene, Joe and Friedrich scene. Like some people like it more than um, than the umbrella scene. It's such a good scene, and it shows well, how much they have that similar similar worldview. Well, and just like his his um his behavior with Mrs. Kirk's children, or with his nephew. These were the ways uh, the other moral foundations, value system foundations that they shared because. Joe just as much would be playing on the floor with the children. And that's not how everybody is. They shared that value system. Yeah. And somebody recently commented on Tumble. People don't understand why Joe wants to start the school. In the book, there are so many scenes where Joe speaks about how much he loves young boys, how much he loves kids, how much he loves boys how she adores yeah. boys and yeah. there are like many scenes in many different chapters that really hint that joe loves boys yes <laughs> and that friedrich has two nephews that's only a plus for joe right yeah and to see how how much he loves his nephews on top mm. of that joe loves that he is a dad I think it's because people don't know that because, you know, it's not in the movies. And I understand why it's not in the films because people don't want to see Joe wanting to be a mom. I think it's also that they need to cut more characters, right? It's they, they keep Mrs. Kirk's children because they needed her a reason for Joe to be moving, right? It's I'm going to, I'm mm-hmm. going to be teaching these children, but they cut his nephews from everything because it's too many extra scenes. Yeah. It's too much more to explain. And this is why we need a really, a really good mini series <laughs> that mm. is Little Women. And I and I mean I know the other ones, the ones that have been made have have their positive things, but a good film adaptation of a book is the nineteen thirty nine Gone with the Wind. It's an excellent film version of a book. But it cuts a ton. And it's still very long, right? It's, it's like a it's like a three and a half hour film, and but like it cuts lots of stuff out. But I feel like the fact that they didn't try to cut it down to an hour and a half or a two hour film is why nobody's bothered to try to remake Gone with the Wind is because they got it right the first time. And I feel like we keep on remaking Little Women because there's always something missing in the new adaptation. That's really you know? well said. So I think we need a mini series where we get these things that we don't have, where we get Lori playing music, where we get Friedrich with his, with his nephews. We get to actually get to know these characters more instead of it being mostly about Joe. It can be about Joe, but it can be about all the people that are important in her life. You see Joe with Lori, but then in the book there are all these moments when Joe also hangs out with other boys because she loves yeah. boys so much. But you know, you don't see that in the films. You don't see them putting an effort showing how much Joe loves boys, which yeah. also explains why she wants to start a school, but also yeah. how she has these maternal feelings for Lori and all these boys in the world because she's the Wendy. 
I've said this before, my dream adaptation would have Friedrich in Berlin before he moves to America and showing oh, his that. character there as well as when showing the lives of the girls in Concord. Oh, I love that. You know, it's almost like we need like a prequel mm. where we where we see where we see the lead up of the March father before he goes away, right? Oh yeah. And because we we also know that that the March father is also kind of based off of Louis de Alcott's dad and, and, and all of his weird things like fruit land and like his, his weird pursuits that did not benefit his family financially that actually kind of sunk his family. I have really I think, mixed feelings about Joe's father because I don't think he's only based on Bronson because Bronson okay. was a teacher. Then yeah. Joe's father is a minister. Oh, okay. But- then there are also some similarities, but then there are also differences because I think Joe's father has a lot much stronger work ethics than Bronson Alcott had. Oh yeah, for sure. Her dad's choices so much impacted the fate of the family and mm. the fact that, that I mean, that Louisa May Alcott wrote the sensational stuff that she wrote, just like how Joe did to mm. help feed her family. I've been meant to read March by Geraldine Brooks because Mm -hmm. I think it tells about Joe's father when he was in the war, like as a war minister. I thought that was really interesting. I think I want to read that one at some point because it's like a fictional story from Joe's father's point of view. In the book club mentioned that, I think they said that that the marches were part of the Underground Railroad or something. And and I, you know, the interesting thing with that is, is that we do know that the Alcotts were a part of the Underground Ra- mm. Railroad. I mean, but, but we know from reading Little Women that in that, in that book, the marches were not a part of the Underground Railroad. So I'm sure that story is, is an interesting one to read. In the book club, I've been trying to figure out what direction people want to go as far as we're going to read books and then discuss them, what books they want to read. And everybody pretty much wanted to read the sequels next. So our mm-hmm. book, our next book we're going to be discussing is Little Men, and then we'll do Joe's Boys. But I was really hoping people would be a little more interested in reading some of Louisa May Alcott's sensational works. You know, the only one I've read mm-hmm. so far is A Long Fatal Love Chase, yeah. which I thought was so much fun. Like, I mean, I, mm-hmm. I enjoyed it. And, but I, there's a number of them that are like, seems so, like so fun to read. And so far, nobody's been super interested in that. And I also was hoping that maybe people might be interested in reading some of the biographies, but literally no one wanted to read any of the biographies. <laughs> we'll start with with Joe's Boys and, and, or sorry, Little Men and then Joe's Boys. And then I think think I'm going to push again for the reading and other, other works by Louise May Alcott and hopefully some of the more sensational ones. I think it would be fun to contrast her writing mm. style with that of the books that were more the sweet stories that were more for the public. Well, you and I can do some kind of reading challenge at some point. Okay, sounds fun. Yeah, I recently read Little Man. I want to do a review about it. The the way we're doing our reading and our movie challenges, we're doing a different movie every month and a different book every other month. And we, we're starting our movie challenges on the 15th of every month. And then we're starting the reading challenge challenges or like discussions, I should say. I'm sorry. Mm. The discussions of the challenges on the first of every other month. We are starting to discuss Little Men starting March 1st. And we'll discuss that for the length of two months. And then we'll do Joe's Boys. We miss you. We miss you in the group. Oh, it's, it's a really nice group. When I was younger, I really loved Little Man at some point. I read it all the time. I just started it again last night. So I just read the first chapter last night. I forgot how much I liked it. And I, and there's a part of me that's like, do I like little men better than I like little women? I, I might, I might actually like it better. It very much pulls you in. And I, I don't know that I really felt as much that way. The last time I read little women, I know that when I read it, when I was a teenager, it was like, I couldn't put it down. I read the whole thing in one day. I'm like, that's insane. <laughs> that's insane. <laughs> I read all of, and I mean, part one and part two in, in one day. I realized when I was reading it, one of the reasons why I liked it, it was because I kind of had a crush on Nat when I was younger. Okay. Now, when I think about Nat, it's more like a maternal feelings that I have for him. Then mm-hmm. I've heard. A lot of people saying that they kind of felt the same with Laurie 
when they were kids, they kind of fell in love with Laurie. But now yeah. when they read it, they have the similar feeling that Joe has for him. Yeah. It's like maternal. I, I don't want to hurt you, but <laughs> you're not being productive. And I had the same with Nat. I didn't have that with Laurie, but with Nat for some reason. But then I read it and well, Nat and Laurie are very similar. Yeah, and well, and then Lori's the one who sends Nat to Joe to begin with, yeah. And Nat is a musician. Musician, yes. And then he ends up with Daisy, and Daisy is very much like Amy because Daisy tells oh. Nat to stop daydreaming. Yes, and she's also hyper-feminine, too. Yeah, very strong parallel there to Lori and Amy. That was interesting, but I also read it because it had so many John Friedrich scenes that I liked. When the parting came, he affected high spirits to conceal certain inconvenient emotions, which seemed inclined to assert themselves. This gaiety did not impose upon anybody, but they tried to look as if it did for his sake, and he got on very well till Mrs. March kissed him with a whisper full of motherly solicitude. Then feeling that he was going very fast, he hastily embraced them all round, not forgetting the afflicted Hannah, and ran downstairs as if for his life. Joe followed a minute after to wave her hand to him if he looked round. He did look round, came back, put his arms about her as she stood on the step above him, and looked up at her with a face that made his short appeal eloquent and pathetic. Oh, Joe, can't you? Teddy, dear, I wish I could. That was all, except a little pause. Then Laurie straightened himself up, said, it's all right, never mind, and went away without another word. Ah, but it wasn't all right, and Joe did mind, for while the curly head lay on, on her arm a minute after her hard answer, she felt as if she had stabbed her dearest friend. And when he left her without a look behind him, she knew the boy Laurie never would come again. Do you think Joe ever identified with Laurie? With him being a boy. You know, I think so. I do think so. Like to, And I, I feel like the 1994 film did a good job of showing this, like with in, introducing him into the Pickwick Society and stuff mm. and the behavior, like the way that Winona Ryder portrayed the character. I do think so. I think that when they were younger, but I think by this point in the novel, I think that she's coming into her womanhood more. And so... That's probably part of the reason why she feels so inclined to reject him, because she knows that's not what she wants. She doesn't know what what she wants yet, but she knows what she doesn't want. And she knows she doesn't want her boy to be her man. It reminds me of that quote from Christine Doyle, where she writes that Laurie represents fascination of Joe's youth and Friedrich the fascination of Joe's adulthood. Mm -hmm. And then Louisa May Alcott has this fascination to this idea that the character grows when they move on from an unsatisfying relationship to the one that works, which makes sense. But also yeah. it's an adulthood ritual when you do that. Well, and, and look at, look at Louisa May Alcott's relationships, right? You know, her relationship with, I always forget how to pronounce his name. Ladislas, what is his name? Laddie. Laddie. Yeah, his, so her relationship with Laddie, like clearly there were ways that he made her feel special mm -hmm. and made her feel maybe a little more alive because she's already been through her unrequited love with Thoreau. We know that Friedrich is like her idealized love, which is with Henry David Thoreau. And I, I think that it's not as simple as, oh, this was a bad one and this one's a good one, because Joe's relationship with Lori definitely serves a purpose. And so did Louise Malcott's relationship with Laddie, right? Mm -hmm. Because because it does feel nice to be wanted, even if you know you don't want to be with that person. True. But it feels a lot better to be wanted when you want the person who's wanting you, which is what Joe gets and what Louisa May Alcott wishes she would have gotten. There are times when Louisa May Alcott refers that these ladies who Ladislas in her stories is playing with, they are like toys for him, mm -hmm. that they are his playthings, that he's not yeah. serious with them. 
Mm-hmm. So that is why she can never marry him because she knows that he's not going to be serious with her. I was just thinking about that scene when Freddy comes to court Joe and the narrator mentions that Joe forget to compare him to Laurie because Freddy, he replaces that ideal man that Laurie used to be. This proposal, it destroyed that ideal man. Jo- Laurie was Joe's model for masculinity, but yeah. man was supposed to be like. Yeah. But then she realizes that no, man is not supposed to behave the way Laurie is behaving in this proposal yeah. chapter. Freddy, yeah. He proposes in a much more uh, respective way. Yeah, he's mm-hmm. more respectful and he's humble and he's not expectant. You know, I mean, that's one of those things, too, is Lori basically presents it in a way where it's like, no, you can't say no to me. And Friedrich is more like, you have no reason to say yes to me other than the fact that I love you. They're such opposites. And I think because Joe got so many influences from Lori and he from her, but then when Joe is with Friedrich, she gets influences from him that are mm-hmm. much more beneficial for Joe in the long run. Yeah. Same with Lori and Amy. They complement each other better. Well, it looks like we finished the chapter. <laughs> ah, what is our conclusion about this chapter? It's the blueprint for a red flag relationship. <laughs> exactly. Now, when we can get this into an adaptation, because it's freaking 2022. Yeah. And it's never been there. We need a miniseries, and we need a good miniseries. Or we need, like, a set of films, like, three films, like Lord of the Rings. Or, like, okay, like, how they've they've been doing Bridgerton on Netflix. Mm, Yeah, why not? Wouldn't that be great? Because, I mean, that's how they're going to be doing, I think they were going to be doing a new Harry Potter or something like that. Yeah, I've heard about that. Full series with good script writers. Right. Brown skinned Lori, German guy to play Frederick. Right. A 12 you know year old the, girl to play Amy or younger. You, the young you know, the Amy. I, irony was is that the guy they got to play Friedrich in this last film oh. really looked more like what Lori should look like. A lot of people have said that. You know, isn't that weird? And people have said the same about Rosanna Brassi because he has brown skin. Oh, yeah, yeah. Super interesting. Yeah, I want now. I totally want a series. I want I want Netflix to treat this like they did Bridgerton. Well, I think there are so many spicy things that can be taken from the book. Joe's sexual awakening in New York. Yeah, the making out scenes of Joe and Frederick in the sequels. You know, I I think that part of the problem too, like with um like the 1933 and 1949, is I'm pretty sure they wouldn't have wanted to go too heavily German with Friedrich because that's true the United States was not feeling very happy towards mm-hmm. Germany at that point so you yeah. can't make the German guy like the knight in shining armor I had a guest on the podcast we had a long discussion about this because she had German ancestry mm-hmm. and then she talked about the Germans in Hollywood mm-hmm. back then in the 1930s and now because we have much more access to German actors yeah and there are some that are doing pretty well in hollywood hopefully we are getting some adaptations with german friedrich i would love that because louis mayo loved germany (laughs) it is a german character why he should not be played by a german actor and laurie could be played by an italian actor or brown skin or or an italian american actor right italian american actor right Either way, I mean, but but he needs to have dark hair and he needs Mm. to be olive skinned. It's part of the reason why Laurie feels isolated when he first moves to Concord. Yes. Because he is quite an outgoing guy in general. It almost feels like it's a bit strange that he now is so isolated when he comes there. Because I would imagine Laurie being someone who makes friends pretty easily. Yes. But then I'm thinking, well, maybe these people in Concord haven't really seen a guy with all his olive skin before. Yeah. Would that be the reason? I don't know. That would that would make sense. You know, we should start writing to Netflix and demand <laughs> they make us a series. People would watch it. You know they would. Definitely. Anyone who listens to this 
podcast would watch it. Yeah. People in the Facebook group, they would watch it. You know, our book club is up to 182 members now. That's great. I mean, it's kind of blows my mind because mm. I think, you know, like when I created that book club, I thought it was only going to last like two months after that 2019 <laughs> movie because that's what it was made for. It was made just to discuss, you know, like to reread the book yeah. and discuss the other film adaptations on the way to this new one being released. People just keep joining. I guess this is a forever, <laughs> forever <laughs> club now. We, and, and more recently, we've gotten some more men joining the club. Which I find I find that interesting because I hadn't personally actually spoken to a lot of men who mm. were little women fans, but our new members who are male are huge fans and very knowledgeable. It's an interesting thing to get a different point of view. You know, it's funny because I know two, no, three Finnish people beside myself who are Joe and Fredrik fans. Mm-hmm. And then honestly, most of the people that I've read like in Finnish book blogs, Actual and more shippers, or I don't go to those blogs anymore. I know two German Fredic shippers from Finland who are both men. One of them is a woman, but I just got to know her. But this is really interesting because one of them is my old teacher, and he used to read a little woman series to his daughters, and he had like a big family. Mm-hmm. And then one day we just started to talk about little woman. This happened many years ago and and of green gables like he had read all the girl books from the 19th yeah. century all, all the books that we we read right? yeah and mm-hmm. i thought it was so funny and he was one of my favorite teachers we talked about little woman and he said he would want his daughters to rather marry a Frederick than laurie because laurie was terrible in that proposal scene yes <laughs> well, and this is one of those things, too, that in society in general, I wish that we would quit referring to these different books as being girl books. When they came out, they weren't. They were just, this is a new book that's a great book. Everyone was reading Little Women. It wasn't like, oh, all the girls are reading Little Women. Everyone was reading mm. Little Women. All of these characters are relatable. You know, it's the same way as like, I read the books by Mark Twain that were boy books, mm. you know? Because they were good books. We all, uh, most of us have read Harry Potter. It's a boy lead, but it Mm. doesn't matter. They're good characters. So I wish that we could get a better view society-wise on on not making girl books, books with female leads as being just for girls. Because, oh, people are missing out on such good books. I wonder where where it started. Because, like you said, both genders used to read them. All people. Yeah. I have this collection of girl book series from the 60s, and it's it just like books for girls. And then there's Anne of Green Gables and Emily of New Moon, Little Woman series. They're girl books because they have female leads. That was in the 60s. I don't think they do that anymore, you know, but it's like a stereotype. I would guess that it was in the post World War II time, right? Because we know. I'm going to use another Gone with the Wind reference here, but Gone with the Wind, the novel came out in 1936. And again, female lead, and everybody read that book. Mm. Like it was insane the amount of people who read that book. But that is more before even the biggest parts of the war war happening and all of that. Mm. Everything was just kind of ramping up at that point. Versus after World War II, you get more into this split of you got Nancy Drew and the, and then you have the Hardy Boys. You know, one's for girls, one's for boys. You know what I mean? And so I think I think that there was something that happened. It's just like during World War II, we had the situation. I I know that it was this way in America, and I know it was this way in Great Britain, where where women were going out and doing these jobs that were normally mm. men's jobs because men's were men were fighting the war. This is what had to happen. But when the men came back from the war, the women were kind of forced out of all these jobs again. And I think that we kind of did this like over course correction in society where it's like, oh, no, no, you cannot be like the boys. You have to be like the girls. Mm -hmm. And that's where we get this Donna Reed and leave it to Beaver family where, (laughs) you know what I mean? And, And so if I had to guess, I would guess that that is where 
it happened was this this big shift in the men are back and the men are in control and the men are do the man stuff and the women do the women stuff and and so the lines i think got drawn even more severe than they had been before just a theory maybe it's interesting yeah i know men who have read a little woman and i recently i went to check my youtube statistics from my channel and i was mm-hmm. quite surprised that 30% of my viewers on the little woman youtube channel are men oh. and 70% are women but still that's quite a lot of male viewers yeah it is it really is it's more than i would have expected i was really surprised because i would imagine that a little woman podcast would attract mostly female viewers but no yeah. there are some guys who like to listen me talking <laughs> that's good yeah. that's really good <laughs> i i mean i think in our in that book club i think we've only probably got like five men mm. in, the, in the i mean that's like i said out of 182 people and i'm happy that the five of them want to be there definitely and i think that's great one of them that just joined recently he shared how much the book means to him and he shared about being on the autism spectrum and how he feels like Beth could could be on the autism spectrum mm-hmm. too and i felt the same thing i myself am on the spectrum and when i reread the book i was like oh that's possible that could be part of some of the ways that beth is where her shyness and wanting to go ahead and and stick to her routines mm-hmm. and all that she could be on the autism spectrum too i recommended to him that he may enjoy uh, anne of green gables because I most definitely think that the character of Matthew Cuthbert would be on the autism spectrum. And um, I have never thought of that. And that's the thing is like in that time period, right? There was no actual, the idea of autism no. was not a thing yet. It wasn't created yet. And so if you were on the autism spectrum, you probably would just be considered maybe, you know, it'd be the blacksmith who was really good at being a blacksmith, but mm. never got married. And I'm not saying autistic people can't get married. Obviously I'm married. <laughs> But like in that time period, it would have been more like, oh, it's maybe the eccentric or the shy or whatever person. And so if you if you look at the character of Matthew that way, you're like, oh, he definitely would be sounds like he's on the spectrum. You know, his incredible shyness is very much sticking to his his routine. I think he's I think he's on the spectrum. Then he has a very dominant sister. Yes. Mm. And so I recommended that book to this, this fellow who just joined the club. And he had said that somebody else said, hey, like his aunt, I think, or someone had just recommended to him that oh. the Anna Green Gable series. So here's another man who, who he's about to go ahead and read Anna Green Gables. And I'm like, I love that because there, there are some really, really great characters in that series. And I think it's a beautiful representation of how, of people and community and relationships and, you know, I think everybody should read Anne of Green Gables. Oh. I think it's wonderful. The only book series that I have read more often than Little Women are Harry Potter and of Green Gables. Yes. They're, <laughs> they're good. They're ones that just, they don't stop being good. You know, they always have something yeah. in them. Somebody you know. left me a comment that Gilbert's proposal to Anne in the 80s Anne of Green Gables series, uh-huh. it's almost word by word from Little Woman 1933. Oh, I am planning to make an episode about this at some point, but at the moment, I don't have the 1933 film as a DVD, so I need to buy it first. Yeah, I've seen it many times, but I don't own it. Yeah, <laughs> but I want to study this because I think that's interesting. I I didn't notice that. It makes me want to pull out my Anna Green Gables and mm. watch that scene since I since I just watched the 1933 one. Is the book just like that scene? You know, like I know that Lucy Mont- Montgomery was a big fan of Little Woman. Yeah, and there are a lot cool. of people who say that oh, they see Anne and Gilbert in Joe and Laurie. My problem with that is that Joe is nothing like Anne because Anne is much more similar to Amy or Meg mm-hmm. because she's very feminine and there is she loves feminine things. She, she loves to be a girl. Yeah. So I don't understand that comparison. I, I would guess that it's only the, the book, writing part. Yeah, the bookishness and maybe the temper. Yeah, the temper and the bookishness. Like there is the scene in Anne of Green Gables that I'm almost like, that's 
nothing like Joe. Anne is in the church and she makes these makeovers for all the people who are in the church. Like she erases their moles and gives them hairdos. I'm like, yeah, that's nothing like Joe. Yeah. <laughs> well, and the romanticism, right? She's mm. so, I mean, Anne is like obsessed with the romantic right you know yeah she's very... she's more like lori that way yeah she's a daydreamer yeah. yeah and i think actually gilbert in many ways he's like lori but he's also a lot like friedrich gilbert yeah. loves school yeah gilbert he also likes to make like pranks and jokes he understands other people's emotions a lot better than lori does because this, this is another one i read when i was 13 i read the whole series when i was 13 mm. And for me, the literary boyfriend I wanted was Gilbert. That's who I wanted as a boyfriend. Who didn't? Because he was, he was smart, but he was fun. And he was steadfast without being stalkery. It was, it's a difference. It's a difference between being like, I'm going to stare at you through your window and the, I'm going to go ahead and be a shoulder to cry on when you need a shoulder to cry on. When Anne says no to Gilbert, Gilbert stops pursuing her and then he goes back to her when she thinks that and might give her a chance now. But yeah. he stops pursuing her when she says no. Yeah. That's a big difference. Oh, I love Gilbert. Everyone loves Gilbert. <laughs> Gilbert, my dream boyfriend when I was 12. Then I wanted to marry Frederick when I was 17. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to marry Captain Wentford from um, Jane Austen. Oh, yes. Persuasion. (laughs) Yes. I love Jane Austen. It's so funny. Um, In the book club right now, you know, we have our questions that people have to answer to see, you know, to get into the club. And the big, big question is, how did you find us? And almost everybody lately who's been saying how they found us, it's that they're in a Jane Austen book club (laughs) where apparently somebody's talking about our book club. I should probably be in that book club because I'm really kind of a bigger Austinite than I am an Alcott, you know, like, and oh, Captain Wentworth, swoon. I know everybody gets all obsessed with Mr. Darcy, but Captain Wentworth, he really was the one. His letter, The End Mm. of Persuasion. I love Persuasion. It's such a good one. I love the book and the movie, the one from the 90s. Yes. The new one was also Pretty good, but I like the, the one, one from with, the, the nineties. The one with Kieran Hines, you know, the one with Kieran Hines playing. Yeah, yes, one. I own Amazing. that one because it is superior in every way. I love too. They cast people who were attractive enough in that, but they didn't cast people mm. who were just purely beautiful. And wasn't That's written good. to be beautiful. Yeah, she's yeah. like one of the most plain-looking Jane Austen heroines. Well, and I love the way they always describe her as like basically kind of blooming you know mm-hmm. like she, like throughout the novel she's like becoming more her own self and her own person and she like blooms and then she is beautiful not because she's actually beautiful but because she's happy yeah. which makes her beautiful no i want to watch that again me too <laughs> <laughs> wentford and knightley they're pretty close to fritz in certain ways and oh what or am I forgetting his name? Um Sense and Sensibility Colonel The one that Alan Rickman played. Yes. In the movie. <laughs> yes. I'm like, I don't care if you're older. I love you. Now let's go run away. <laughs> it's like when people yeah. complain about Joseph Friedrich's age difference. Nobody complains about Jane Austen movie age differences or Jane Austen right? book age differences. Right? I mean, think about that, though. Like, in Emma Knightley, he's, like, I think, like, 15 years or 18 no, years older than 19 her. years, Emma 19 Knightley. years. 19 oh, okay. years. I checked it. Okay. And, uh, yeah, that's a big difference, because she was only, yeah. like, 21 or something, wasn't she? She was. Yeah. Nobody complains about that. They complain about Joe and Frederick all the time, but they don't complain about Captain and Marianne. <laughs> Captain and Marianne, I think that was, like, 16 years or something. Yeah, because I mean, they, I mean, it's kind of a big plot point that he's supposed to be older. Yeah, nobody complains about that either. <laughs> Colonel Brandon, that's Colonel his name. Colonel Brandon, exactly. Um, 
Elizabeth and Dorothy, I think that was eight or nine years. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. Nobody complains about that. I read some of the more like fan fiction-y type of Pride and Prejudice books. And sometimes they're like lots of fun. And there's a series, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's like Pride and Prejudice and Dragons. Oh, and I don't know that one. <laughs> oh, it's so fun. It's It's like an eight book series now. And by like further in the series, they do incorporate like the characters from Persuasion into it too. And it's so much fun. Like I really first read the first book just thinking I was going to be like, oh, this is silly, you know, (laughs) but it's so much fun. I just bought the eighth book, you know, yesterday because I'm like, you know what? I'm hooked. I'm hooked. I've got to read all of them. And it's funny when people say that Friedrich is old and I feel like they want to make him to be 60 or something. Then he's only 39 in the book. Yeah. And I just wonder because you get people who say that they have read the book and in the book it says that he's barely 40 and still complaining yeah. that he's old and these people are in their 40s or in their 30s. Okay, cuz I'm going to say I get it when you're younger cuz I when yeah. I was younger, when I was 22, I dated a man who was 38 for a minute. And I thought he like looked good for his age. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And, and like, he was in good shape and everything, but like, really now my current age, I'm 41 years old and my husband is 39 years old to think that when I was 22, that I thought a 38 year old was like old, it seems absurd to me. So to think that there could be people who are actually like my age, who think that Friedrich is too old for Joe, it just seems really kind of silly. Where'd that girl accept that? She's 37 herself. Yeah, no, and she's I'm with married you. to a guy who is a lot older, 14 years older. Almost two and Freddie age difference. She didn't read the book. There's no way she read the book. What was going on in her head? I don't get it. Because why do you complain about Joe falling in love to an older guy when you are yourself in a relationship with an older man? And why do you yeah. say that Freddie is old when he's 39 in the book? And yeah. why do you say that Joe and Laurie would be a great couple together? Because obviously they are not. And why do you say yeah. that Lori wants Joe to be an adult when in the book it's the opposite? I, I don't think she read the book. I feel like, you know, <laughs> it's just like how you don't just jump into a podcast and go, I'm just going to talk about this. You you research things. You say, oh, what's the, you know, what's the motivation here? Who is this character inspired by? I feel like if I was going to put, you know, create my own Little Women film, I wouldn't just read Little Women. I would read Little Women, Little Men, Joe's Boys. I would read Louise Matt Alcott's journals. I would, you know what I mean? I would get mm. a full understanding of of the world in which the story t- is created and, and the person who created the story. And I feel like the 2019 film has kind of been billed as this film that took more into account Louise Matt Alcott's feelings. But I'm like, you can say it all you want, but the evidence is not in front of us as far as what the film turned out as. She's trying to mash up Joe and Louisa, but then Mm -hmm. that Joe and that Louisa, it was not based on the book and it was not based on Louisa May Alcott's biographies or anything that I've read. And I've read quite a lot. And you read quite a lot. Yeah, and this insistence that like Joe wouldn't want to get married because Louisa May Alcott didn't want to get married. Louisa May Alcott wanted to get married. She just didn't want to get married to just anybody. She wanted to get married to her own Professor Bear. I don't see how somebody wouldn't get that. She knew that she could support herself through her writing. So why would she marry just for the sake to get married, which a lot of people had to do in that time. Mm -hmm. Marriage was a financial institution. This idea that she didn't want to get married, it's just so, it's just so not true. And it's in her diaries where she writes that she did have these wishes to get married and she was lonely when that didn't happen. She had wishes to have a family and she was heartbroken when that didn't happen. I think one of the problems with Louisa May Alcott was that because she was afraid that people were going to destroy her if they would find out about Laddie, for example. So she had to censor her journals. But then we have these non-censored journals left where we know what, at least some of of the things that happened between her and him. Then we have some 
evidence left what happened between her and Henry, her first mm-hmm. crush for Emerson. And mm-hmm. I think there's actually quite a lot of evidence about Louis Malcolm's love life. We just need to start to put them all together for people mm-hmm. to learn about them. Yeah. When cool. I started to do this whole research about Laurie and Friedrich, one of the first things that I came across was stories that Louis Malcolm used to read as a child which all repeat this whole German Friedrich narrative or Amy and Laurie narrative. And I thought that was really, really interesting. Yeah. And then you see some of that in her actual relationship. That was even more interesting. It, it kind of goes along with that idea of there's like psychologists always talk about how we try to recreate elements of our childhood and our adulthood. And maybe since she wouldn't be trying to recreate that situation with how her father was as a male figure, because she clearly did have some issues with her father. So what's she going to try to recreate? She's going to try to recreate her, the story she reads. She gets her own Lori or her own, what was his name? Was it Werther from? Werther, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, she gets her own version of that. She gets her own Emerson or Thoreau or whatever the other romantic characters were in the books she reads. Maybe she's recreating that part of her childhood in her adulthood or in her writing. Somebody left me a comment, Kimberly from the Louisa May Alcott group. She left me a comment that Louisa May Alcott was actually rewriting her childhood and her adulthood to uh, suppress a trauma, to recover from a trauma. Mm -hmm. And the trauma could be her childhood with, because they were super poor. They were not... They were a lot more poorer than the March family. Yeah. And then Henry passed away. That's another trauma. Yeah. Because she had, at some point at least, imagined a future with him. Little woman is, in a way, a wish fulfillment. I never get that when people say that, oh, Jo married her father. But honestly, Friedrich is written to be the opposite of Bronson Alcott. No, he's stable. He's He's stable. stable. He's reliable. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know where that comes from. Does it come from people who ship Joe and Laurie or people who just hate Friedrich without any reason, like Greta Gerwig? Or people but, who don't really understand mm-hmm. how unstable and unreliable Luis May Alcott's father was. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, you have to see when you read about Friedrich that he is a good example of a father, right? He's a good father figure. So maybe that's part of why they think that she's recreating her father. But it's like, no, Louisa Mal- Alcott's father was completely unstable and unreliable. And the reason why the family struggled the way they did. And I think a lot of people don't know about Louis' love for Thoreau. And yeah. Henry Thoreau was a philosopher, transcendentalist philosopher, and a yeah. good friend with Louis's father. And people don't know that. They just think that think that, oh, Jo marries a philosopher like her father. But honestly, yeah. we have Emerson there. Then we have Thoreau. Yeah. And all this German philosopher, Friedrich yeah. Schiller. <laughs> we yeah. Have Goethe. I mean, look at the people that she was surrounded with. Yeah. I wish people would talk more about that. Or, you know, we really need a, we really need a Louise and Alcott movie. That's what we need. Because then maybe people would understand the Friedrich relationship better if they saw the great minds that she was surrounded by and that really accepted her with open arms to show what a great mind she was. Okay. It was great to have you here. It was great talking with you. Yeah. Uh, Listeners are going to like this. I sure hope so. Well, have a, have a great night. Thank you. And you have a great day. Yay. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Bye. Bye. That was the awesome talk between Melody and myself. Thank you so much for listening. Take care and make good choices. Bye!